Welcome to Transmission Podcast. I'm your host, Cecilia Lynn Jacobs. For the next little while, we invite you to speculate on the possibility of life on Proxima b, the closest known planet outside of our solar system that has the potential to support life. In each episode, we question what would happen if we suddenly knew we were no longer alone in the universe, and what that would mean for humanity to become an interstellar civilization. Please, stay close. episode of Transmission Podcast, we're getting lost in translation. Today I'm joined by producer Kate Leidenheim. Hi everyone. And we're talking about communication. Kate and I were just in Paris conducting interviews with Medi scientists, and we'll be releasing all of that content soon, but one of the things we ran into was a language barrier. Even basic communication became difficult, and that doesn't even take into account nuances within shared language. Biscuit, post, pants, jumper. All of these words are common to American and British English, but we understand them differently across the Atlantic. Now let's imagine something entirely alien. A civilization from another planet might communicate in smell or by transmitting chemical signals. How can we hope to connect? Dr. Christine Corbett Moran starts us out with nothing short of a Manhattan Project scale effort to start. I think that you'd probably want to dive into the question of decoding communications. You'd probably have a Manhattan-style project where you have researchers from a variety of different fields come together and try to work on this signal that initially makes no sense. That's Dr. Christine Corbett Moran. My name is Christine Corbett Moran, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Caltech. I work in theoretical astrophysics. So in that effort, I could contribute data analysis and that sort of stuff, basically computer programming and talking with people and trying to brainstorm new ways to attack the problem. But that isn't something that I'm involved in my daily research right now. It'd be more like you would have to tap a variety of scientists to contribute to the effort because you'd need a lot of creativity to be able to decode a signal, uh, especially when you can't really reply in real time. Well, it would, I think it would probably create a whole new field of study. That's Peter Worden from Breakthrough Initiatives. You know, if you found some sort of imagery and you, you know, obviously you begin to look at content or the, the entities in it, is there a an audio track with it? Are there other tracks of information that, that I mean, in, in, in a television signal, you have the images, but you also have interleaved the sound and other things. So we'd have to untangle what's in this, this signal. And presumably, if they hadn't intended it for us, that may take some time uh, in terms of determining all the content that's there. Uh, I would guess that uh, it's probably a you know, a multi-year, maybe even a multi-decade effort to to extract the content if they didn't try to make it easy for you. And maybe it would be faster, but it's uh, the, the recent movie uh, Arrival is sort of an interesting and probably not too bad of a discussion of, of how one begins to try to extract content and, and languages and so on. And, and, and indeed, the, the, the language may be truly alien. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, you know, we have species on the planet that communicate by light, that communicate by, you know, motions, communicate by, you know, chemical interactions and, and so forth. Uh, that's why I think it's probably would, you know, not being able to interact with it, it may take a considerable time to, you know, and, and we'd never be entirely sure that we've got all the content. Essentially, we have no idea what this language will look or sound like, or even if it will be based in sight or hearing. And without two-way communication, it will take considerable effort to understand the semantic differences between us and our new neighbors. 
Given these challenges, who should we recruit to help us decode an alien transmission? I think you'd need linguists and physicists and a variety of engineers. You'd need probably philosophers as well. Um, Almost anyone with a technical background could contribute, but I think it would have to be really a large team of people just looking at the signal with different perspectives to even have a hope of decoding things. You probably also need experts in artificial intelligence and programming because more than likely the patterns in the data won't be easy for a human to see. So we'd have to kind of program uh, different pattern spotting machines to try to get our, our hooks into what the meaning could be. But the humans would be there to kind of recognize, you know, when they did get some meaning or did get some pattern, uh, whether to continue down that line or to make the decision to, to look elsewhere. That's Christine Corbett Moran again, but she suggests that perhaps we begin with simpler means of communication, numbers. Sure. I definitely think that on the converse, that things like numbers um, and mathematics would be easy for us to spot. Those are kind of universal concepts, independent of language. Um, They're easy to encode in signals. So mathematical concepts would be very easy to uh, spot. More abstract concepts, for example, if it's, say, a video feed coded in some manner and maybe not even visual data only, perhaps they, whoever they are, um, communicate in smell or in, in, in touch. And so the encoding is not of optical data, but some other combination of senses, maybe not even just one sense. When we watch TV, we hear sound and we see see something. And what if the encoding was instead smell and touch and this multidimensional data set? That would be quite hard. Um, so I think the initial communication might be of these more simpler abstract concepts, um, you know, math, series, kind of just recognizing that the first thing in a signal is you have to prove that you're not from nature, that it's not coming from just a random physical process, that it's intelligent life. And so to do that, it has to be kind of simple and pattern and deliberate at first. Pippa Goldschmidt started even more basic and maybe less hopeful. Would we be able to know that they think? or think in the same way that we think about our thinking? We're kind of assuming that there's any kind of meeting point at all, but there might not be. So I, I think I'd, I, I, I just want to say, I, I, assuming that they think that they have some kind of thought process, which is a very sort of anthropomorphic thing to say, anyway, sort of like person-centered thing to say, I'd want to say, well, what do you think? Are you, are you, are you alive? What, what do you think about life for your place in the universe? Catherine Denning at York University in Toronto reminded us that a key or code, like the Rosetta Stone, may be our only hope for translation. Understanding what a transmission is saying may be very hard, but we also might not be able to understand how they communicate at all. That is an excellent question. It's one of the enduring questions within the study and many conversations. You know, what would our hope of decryption actually be? Generally speaking, the anthropological position on this has been we're not usually all that optimistic, and that's because of our knowledge of how these things have historically gone on Earth. Um, It's been very difficult to um, decode, say, some ancient languages. It can be very difficult even to foster effective communication between two different languages when the speakers are right there in each other's faces gesticulating. Um, And in every case, what you need is just some kind of key. Um, So, for example, the Rosetta Stone, which allowed the translation of of hieroglyphs, it wouldn't have been possible had there not been the third language, demonic Greek, present. So the idea that we could just, you know, receive a signal, you know, structured, and go from the structure to the actual semantic content, to the actual meaning... Most social scientists view that as quite optimistic. In terms of how you could crunch it, I mean, there are plenty of different ways to analyze the signal and to um, see the degree of order involved, much as, say, we do with whales. We can understand a lot about the structure of the communication, but we don't actually know very much about what the whales are saying to each other. And so based on all our kind of earthbound experiences, 
I would have to say that we would need a lot of help from the extraterrestrial source. That is, we would need a lot of help from the aliens. <laughs> if they had already figured out a fair bit about us, if they had already included plenty of clues in the transmission that would allow us to translate effectively, that would be great. It sounds like this is all leading up to a remake of Star Trek Four. Yes, but can you remake that movie without Leonard Nimoy? <laughs> you know, he had an album of spoken word over whale song called Whales Alive. Maybe he understood something we didn't. That's unlikely, but is it any more ridiculous to think we could decipher an alien transmission without a primer? More when we return. Stay close. Welcome back. In this episode of Transmission Podcast, we're trying to understand how we would make sense of a language we don't know, and likely won't have any context for. But here's a bigger question. Would we even care to try? Dr. Christine Corbett Moran isn't sure we are. We have a lot of intelligent life on this planet, all the different animals um, that we have. Um, there's higher order intelligent life, chimpanzees and, and whales, and we don't show an especial interest in trying to communicate with them. We try on occasion, but it's not, it's not a focus. And I think as different as humans are from whales, we would be that much more different from another part of intelligent life. Even if that intelligent life was as smart as we are, it's so alien that there's almost not a respect for it. There's not an ability to empathize with it um, and hook into it as something of value. It's just seen that, oh, well, they don't have opposable thumbs, it must be that they're useless. So I think even if it could transmit, you know, like if, if whales had the ability to send us signals directly, <laughs> um, I'm not sure we would spend that much effort trying to get to know whales. So this is a pretty sobering perspective, that we don't have a history of being interested in what other intelligent beings might be saying, that we're just kind of self-centered. Or simply that we don't have the patience to invest in the research. I mean, there are people studying whale and dolphin and chimpanzee communications and trying to make a bridge between our species and theirs, even with mixed results. Christine, given this experience, language aside, do you feel we'd even be able to communicate at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that uh, whales or dolphins or, or chimpanzees, they've made some progress with with chimps and sign language and even gray parrots and communication. So there is rudimentary communication ability of, of animals on earth. But I think it, it's, it's more instructive to just imagine, you know, what if a chimp were just as intelligent as us? How would we communicate? What if a dolphin were just as intelligent? How would we communicate? Since they're not, you know, practicing with them wouldn't necessarily be of importance per se imagining um, what it be, would be like if they were just as intelligent as us and had exactly their physical features, how would we communicate? Because even if the aliens are very similar to us, we could also think that, you know, maybe they don't have vocal cords. Maybe that's not how they communicate. So kind of just brainstorming from a variety of life we have on the planet, you know, what if our big brains were implanted on another animal body, you know, how would that body try to try to communicate? Uh, that would help us in kind of brainstorming the body that the alien brain was embedded in. So let's say we did encounter an alien species. Why don't we call them Luxeterans? It doesn't take an interspecies effort to misinterpret each other. Let's call it Lux to Terran. That's an excellent idea. Okay, so if you're trying to translate Lux to Terran into Chinese, or, you know, let's choose a specific Chinese language, so let's say Mandarin, um, how is that going to be different from translating Lux to Terran 
<laughs> into um, English. How is it going to be different um, from translating it into Swahili, any number of other languages? That's Catherine Denning again. I think we've seen, even just if you just translate regularly, say, between English and French, as we often do in Canada, you, you find some funny things. So I, I think there would be certain irreducible difficulties. And I think the idea that we could have a signal come in and understand it perfectly, that is an idea that's born typically out of the optimism of scientists who work 